Hello, everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. As medical devices are increasingly getting connected to the internet, hospital networks, and to other medical devices, just like any other connected computer system, they are also becoming vulnerable to security breaches from cyberspace, geospace, and space, in short, referred to as CGS. While this potentially impacts the safety, security, and effectiveness of medical devices, it also represents a growing security risk of the medical data the devices contain and the very lives of the human patients. When we, the humans, are at the center of this rapidly evolving vulnerable CGS ecosystem, understandably, security of medical devices becomes a significant risk management concern. To discuss medical device security, I'm delighted to welcome Christopher Friends from Interfaith Medical Center. Christopher is the director at Interfaith Medical Center and he focuses on healthcare information security and privacy. He has authored two computer books and over 75 technical articles. The OVAP set is Open Web Application Security Projects, a Secure Medical Device Deployment Standard, and Entire Ransomware Guide are some of his notable publications. Welcome, Christopher. We are delighted to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, Christopher. So over the years, there has been a rapidly growing integration and interconnection of different medical and information technology devices and systems where medical data is being increasingly exchanged. What is the impact of this integration and interconnection of medical devices? Where is this connectivity taking medicine and healthcare sector? It's, a, it's actually a fairly recent phenomenon. A lot of it comes under the new meaningful use guidelines. As part of the push for meaningful use, um, hospitals are being forced to become increasingly electronic. Um, you're seeing that in the rollout of electronic healthcare systems, electronic medical records, uh, and along that goes the lines of interconnected medical devices. And there are a lot of advantages to that for patient care. Basically, if you take an X-ray, that X-ray can then be automatically sent to a PAC system for a radiologist to read. Um, results transmit to the EHR system um, quite rapidly. Um, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained, and in that case, it's better for the patient. But alongside of that, and um, they cut up the sorry. Alongside of that, though, you not only have the increases in efficiency, but you also do have increasing attack surface. With each device you bring online, you do increase the vulnerability of the organization to cyber attack and to other risk factors. And one of the issues is a lot of these devices were built with the life-saving portion in mind, but they weren't really built with cybersecurity in mind because cybersecurity was much less of an issue when a lot of these devices were first manufactured. And you see a lot of um, issues with that within healthcare because a lot of these devices are very expensive to replace. So you do have a lot of legacy systems running older software, older operating systems that leaves the organization very vulnerable if these devices are connected to the organization's network. Yes, that is very true. And like you said, as medical devices are increasingly getting connected to the internet, hospital networks, and, or, and to other medical devices, there are so many numerous reports emerging that hackers are increasingly taking advantage of this historically sloppy security on the connected and embedded med medical devices. It's not just the connected devices, but also the embedded medical devices. So I mean, that the question, ob obvious question anyone would have is, how vulnerable are we at the moment uh, or because of these medical devices to the security challenges? I think, unfortunately, as recently proven by the um, WannaCry attack, a lot of hospitals are very, very vulnerable. You had the entire NHS system um, throughout Britain pretty much taken offline. There were reports in the US of the WannaCry ransomware also bringing um, certain radiology equipment down, where it actually completely took down the devices. Um, so there's a lot of vulnerability. Um, Hollywood Hospital from earlier last year illustrated the same thing. Hospital brought down by ransomware. A lot of healthcare organizations are still very, very vulnerable, and the medical devices play a big part in that. And a lot of that stems from basically several factors. One is, as I just mentioned, there's a real rush for hospitals to go electronic. So a lot of that in order to meet deadlines that are mandated, a lot of hospitals think about security as an afterthought. And it's very hard to bolt on security later. It really has to be built in from the beginning. But um, a lot of hospitals don't do that. Unfortunately, they rush to meet these deadlines to go electronic and um, don't really give much attention to security. Uh, that's one factor. Another, a lot of legacy systems is another major factor. It's expensive to replace a lot of older, outdated systems. Systems that might work perfectly well from a medical standpoint, 
even though from a security standpoint, they're uh, tougher to deal with. And in healthcare in general, um, you have a big focus on compliance and not necessarily security. And compliance and security are not always the same thing. You can very, very easily be compliant and still be fairly insecure. Um, we could take a historical example of that if you consider the um, TJ Maxx attack from a number of years ago. Basically, uh, wireless came out in the late 90s. Um, WEP was one of the early encryption protocols for that. And by 2001, it was pretty known to be heavily flawed, WEP. By 2003, WPA, a more secure replacement for that, was put out mostly to deal with the flaws in WEP. Fast forward to 2005, TJ Maxx was hacked because it used the older, insecure WEP protocol. But it wasn't until 2008 that PCI DSS started to go around to amend their standard to require WPA over WEP. And they gave companies till roughly 2010 to actually become compliant with the more secure standard. So there's a large gap of years there in which you could be perfectly compliant with regulations, but still be very insecure. And that applies not just to PCI DSS, but to pretty much any kind of standard. HIPAA was created in 1996. It was last updated in 2013. There's a lot of technology that's changed between 2013 and 2017. Um, and that holds true for any kind of standard. And a lot of organizations, unfortunately, just focus on compliance. But in my opinion, that's kind of like going to be like the D student in the class. Yeah, you're going to pass the class, you meet all the check marks, but you're not really doing a good job if you just go for compliance and stop. Very true. You made a very, very good point, Christopher, that all, most of the efforts are going towards compliance. And even if you look at the overall risk profile, not just for this healthcare industry, but for any industry, that 75% of the risk, if you see, is consisting of strategic security risk. But wherever efforts are going are on compliance risk, legal risk, financial risk, and uh, operational risk that which makes only about approximately 25 percent so you're absolutely right that most of our efforts and resources are going towards compliance and managing other secure other risk but where we are need to focus on cyber security risk strategic security risk we are just not able to divert our attention to that or give all the resources and focus that we are supposed to give so that is a very critical uh, risk in itself and it seems that vulnerable medical devices, it's not only, it's uh, because of the, only they are in the part of the hospital we are seeing the risk, but they are also connecting to a huge range of sensors and monitors, which could be outside of the hospital you know, environment. And this makes them potential entry points to larger hospital networks because of the new emerging IOTs and sensors and Fitbits and uh, many other health tracking devices, the attack surfaces is increasing so rapidly. So this means that possibility of the theft of the data, sensitive medical records, or even a devastating ransomware attack that uh, can hold even the whole entire hospitals or medical systems hostage until the owners or administrators pay up the ransom that they are asked for, those chances are increasing so rapidly. So from your assessment, look, because you have been uh, part of the hospital and you have, uh, you are doing very active research on that, how many potential entry points any average hospital has for hackers to get through because we are not just talking about the machines uh, medical machines that we see at the hospitals we are talking about so many different iot sensors and so many different medical devices that are portable oh iot in general is definitely a, a big risk um you had all the recent attacks by the botnet mirai and a lot of those were trivial exploited it was basically a combination of 62 usernames and default passwords that were used to compromise hundreds of thousands of devices that led to some of the largest DDoS attacks in history. Um, the attack on Dyne being one of them, which brought down a lot of internet traffic in the Northeast of the United States. Um, that's one example. Another interesting one actually was a university was recently actually brought to its knees because some of its vending machines and smart light bulbs were compromised by a similar type attack using default usernames and passwords. So healthcare becomes actually pretty interesting because you pretty much have all the issues you deal with in normal IT environments, securing the desktop, securing the servers, securing the network, securing whatever IoT devices and printers and stuff like that you have. But you also have this range of medical devices um, 
and many of them are legacy devices in a lot of hospitals. So it creates additional levels of challenge that you may not see in other businesses. Plus, you also have the fact that in healthcare, the majority of the data you're actually storing is sensitive data, which isn't always true for all other industries. Yes, that's very, very true. And uh, today, medical devices and systems are being designed and operated as special purpose computers uh, and are increasingly getting connected to the internet. In addition, as more features are being introduced and automated, there is increasing amount of medical data that is being collected, analyzed, and stored in any of these devices. So when medical data is increasingly exchanged through the open internet, do we have effective medical device authentication? It really depends from manufacturer to manufacturer and device to device. Um, sometimes even older devices from manufacturer who might, might not do it properly now, but didn't in the past because security was less of an issue. So it really, really varies from device to device. It's hard to give a um, generic answer on that. But there are still a lot of um, insecure devices and there's still quite a long way to go. Yes, that's very true. And it also seems that uh, uh, there are um, either there is a lack of authentication or that could be because of the weak passwords or default and hard code vendor passwords. Like uh, it never gets changed. The manufacturer, whatever they send, like the admin or one, two, three, four that remains without being updated. So that remains a critical security risk in itself and embedded web servers and administrative interfaces make it so easy to identify and manipulate devices once an attacker finds them on a network. So it, these are very complex uh, uh, challenges that's coming just because of the authentication and we don't have proper authentication protocols or processes. Now the capabilities of modern medical devices continue to radically transform the treatment of both acute as well as management of chronic long-term diseases. As we see now, we have so many chronic diseases from diabetes to cardiovascular diseases to uh, many other diseases that uh, patients, human patients needs to be constantly monitored, their blood pressure, their blood sugar. So many things needs to be constantly monitored. So now as these technologies evolve, so does the threats to the security and reliability of these devices. Now, since patient safety and security issues are related to medical device security, healthcare organization security preparedness levels matter so much more. From your assessment, how prepared are healthcare organizations for a security in cyberspace, geospace, and space? It does vary from hospital to hospital and healthcare facility to healthcare facility. But um, unfortunately, you do have a lot of smaller healthcare facilities that really don't have the cybersecurity expertise to make things as secure as they should be, in my opinion. And so um, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare security is not as mature as it is in some other industries. That's very true. And I mean, we are still not uh, prepared to manage the cybersecurity risk. And we are getting very rapidly into the space security with all this uh, hundreds of thousands of nano satellites are that are being deployed anyone can and uh, can create security complex security challenges for any healthcare or any medical facility or any human being with the uh, embedded devices so we are entering into a very unknown space where pretty much it's going to be we don't know at this point how we are going to manage those kind of you know integrated security is coming from cyberspace geospace and space now any healthcare organization typically has, from what I have uh, been noticing, is that they have more medical devices than IT devices at this point because they have that is the way modern medicine works. They are dependent on technology. Now, what trends you see about medical devices and its security risk that are of the most concern at this point? Uh I would say a lack of ability to patch is probably one of the major things. A lot of medical devices, um, because they run older unsupported software, there's no ability to patch them. And that's one of the, the major, major concerns that's somewhat starting to change because the FDA recently issued some post-market guidance. Unfortunately, it's non-binding, so the manufacturer, just a recommendation to manufacturers, it can't be enforced at this time. But um, they are recommending now that manufacturers do put in place mechanisms to patch their devices once they're released. And um, of course, there's many other issues, but lack of the ability to patch systems is one of the major, major ones that I see. 
that's that's very true that uh, the once the devices are embedded or once the devices are starting to use there is no way that you can upgrade those devices if we find out some you know security vulnerability that's just the way the medical devices stand right now and that is a cause of great concern now there are reports that hospital systems can be taken offline and many healthcare organizations are not even aware about where the medical devices are configured in their network within their you know hospital network how easy it is for the hackers to take the hospitals offline uh, again, it's going to vary somewhat from hospital to hospital, but as you mentioned, with not knowing where devices are, I mean, one of the first things I think any organization should do, not just healthcare organizations, is basically create a map of where all its data is located and a map of all the data flows between the various um, parts of the organization that collect data, you know, whether it's a medical device, um, computer, whatever it happens to be, where all the data is being collected, where that data then gets transmitted to, have a map of all the data flows within your organization. That's very useful for a lot of reasons, because if you know where data is supposed to be going back and forth, it makes it very easy to configure internal um, access control lists and your switches and your networks, um, internal firewall rules if you want to control those data flows and protect it. And the other advantage, too, is if you know where data is supposed to be going in your organization, it also makes it easier to identify potential breach attempts and stuff like that, because something that doesn't fit on that list of traffic that you know is supposed to be there is immediately stands out as suspicious and helps to identify um, potential attacks or potential data breach attempts in your organization. So having a map of all the data flows that should be existing in your organization is definitely a big advantage. It's something I think any organization should take the time to do if they haven't done so already. That's a good point that you made. Now, medical devices and systems are being designed and operated as special purpose computers and more and more features are being automated. I mean, because of the electronic health records and because of the advances in technology, we will be seeing so many different processes that were manual that are going, becoming digital. And that uh, is a uh, lot of data. Medical data will be generated and collected, analyzed, and stored in so many different devices, as we just saw, uh, talked about that a little bit briefly earlier. Now, because these medical devices and systems represent a growing risk with respect to the security of not only the patients, but also the medical data they contain, what processes hospitals and other healthcare organizations follow for their data security, and is the process effective? I think the initial process any organization should follow is basically at the time of purchase. They, they should make security evaluations and privacy evaluations. A big part of their purchasing process is um, devices or proposed software that the hospital wants to acquire really should go through some type of security audit, some type of privacy audit within the organization before the hospital makes a purchasing decision. Because in my opinion, one of the best ways to um, mitigate vulnerabilities is to never introduce them in the first place. So if you can eliminate that by buying devices that are only going to allow you to secure them properly, that's a big part of the challenge there. Now, that's not always feasible because you, you're going to have legacy systems in your environment or stuff that was purchased previously that you can't do anything about. You can't change it because it's too expensive. And there are other security controls you can put in place to help with that. I'm a very big fan of uh, network segmentation, network isolation, wherever possible kind of take a zero trust approach to securing the devices. So just allow the device to talk to the couple of systems that it needs to talk to within your environment and not be accessible to anything else. It doesn't mitigate the risk 100%, but it goes a long way towards um, keeping the device as um, the attack surface as small as possible. And if anything is compromised, if it's isolated, it basically minimizes the um, ability to spread within the organization because it will just affect that one isolated network segment and hopefully not escape to other network segments within your organization. So network segmentation is definitely, network isolation, a big one for me. Yes, no, that's, that's a really good, uh, valid point that you make there, you know, network isolation. Now, it seems that there are some who are recommending that uh, healthcare providers, that they should build their networks from the ground up. Do you see a potential security risk associated with network medical devices? That Do you see a need that they need, we need to rebuild all the networks? I mean, for most organizations, realistically, it probably wouldn't be financially feasible to do that. What I would recommend organizations do is they look at the devices they have in their environment. They, they perform their risk assessment based on their own individual organization's use case for that device. And they start from there, basically identify what the biggest risks are for that device within that particular environment, and then 
implement controls that will help mitigate those risks. Yes, no, that that's uh, that's true. It has to be every has each hospital has to you know make their own internal assessment and see whether they need that. Now it seems that hospitals, it's not like they are just going to lose money because of the critical resources for keeping human patients alive. If we, if uh, there is a security breach, it is said that uh, many medical devices are running outdated operating systems like Windows XP and Windows Server 2003. And uh, it seems that the hackers can avoid detection easily by hacking into these kind of devices. And uh, there is no way for the, the hospitals to be able to find out what, where the security bridges are happening and how their patients' lives are getting impacted because of it. So how would the risk, what kind of risk do you see arising from operating system complexity that we are facing because of these outdated uh, operating systems? It's definitely a big problem because any outdated operating system, basically there's no support for from a security standpoint. So there's no patches released. Um, WannaCry was actually a, a good example of that is all those XP machines. Microsoft eventually did go out of their way and release a patch that they weren't required to because it was end of life already. But basically, Windows 7 machines and other Windows, versions of Windows that are still under support, there was a patch released a couple of months before WannaCry actually outbroke that would have prevented the vulnerability from existing if applied. For Windows 7, Windows 2003, um, that patch wasn't available two months ago. It was only put out on an emergency basis. and it might not have been put out at all because there was no requirement for Microsoft to do that. So um, systems like that are much harder to protect because um, patches that would normally close a lot of the vulnerable holes in operating systems are not available for older operating systems that are as support. So any out of support system definitely is an organization much more vulnerable than a system that is still um, current and under support. So it is a big issue. And um, I go back to things like network isolation. Then, if you isolate that device, so it interacts with as few other devices as possible, it does it's a compensating control to really help mitigate that risk yes so it seems now it is also said that uh, one of the other obstacle to security is the age of the equipment many so many devices that are medical devices that are used in hospitals are several decades old 10 15 you know 20 years old and the developers of these you know machines or devices they have they are not even part of the company or those companies may not exist uh, and that all those circumstances make it very complex for updating or fixing vulnerabilities. Like you were just talking about patching it. Now, how can security professionals localize the problem so it doesn't interrupt the continuity of operations? One uh, point you just made, the network isolation. But what else can be done? Uh, there's actually a lot else that can be done as well. It, it's one of the reasons that I think um, hospitals also have to focus on the deployment end. Even if the FDA guidance is followed completely, even though it's non-binding right now, and people started making much more secure medical devices tomorrow, it's going to take years before those new secure devices actually trickle down um, into the healthcare environment. And even in the sense that you were able to acquire a new device, you have to still pay attention to how you deploy the devices as well because you could have all the security features in the world in the device, but if you don't turn them on or deploy them properly, you're still going to be left with something that's very, very insecure. So um, in addition to network isolation and um, there's lots of other techniques you can do. Um, actually, the, the OWASP standard that you had mentioned when you introduced me, the secure medical device deployment, that lists um, about 30 plus controls you can actually use to secure devices. Network isolations, one of them. Um, um, a lot of other things would include like keeping spare copies of the firmware, things like that. So if a device is compromised, you can restore it to operation as quick as possible, having backups. Uh, intrusion detection systems to monitor traffic going to and from devices. Uh, something like Mirai, for example. If you were able to look for login attempts, that excessive number of login attempts for the botnet trying to attack the devices might have been registered by an intrusion detection system, something like that, if you had it available internally. A lot of organizations, they focus very heavily on the security at the perimeter, but they don't focus as much on traffic inside the organization. And if you monitor a lot of the traffic flows you have going on within your organization itself as well, um, it can help you reveal some potential attacks that might not be um, determined at the perimeter level. 
so how the the controls that you were just talking about how widely are they used uh that really varies from hospital to hospital and one of the reasons for doing the OWASP document in the first place was actually to raise awareness of the things that healthcare organizations could do to secure their devices so um hopefully more and more organizations see the document and start to implement a lot of the controls in there but the, the whole purpose of doing the document to start with was to actually raise awareness of the issue and basically give hospitals a checklist of things they can do to actually better secure their devices yes no that's a, that is a good starting point education and awareness and then hopefully you know the hospitals and everyone will build on that now let's talk about the implantable medical devices since wireless communication has become an intrinsic part of modern implantable medical devices in short we call it imds they can also be exploited to compromise the confidentiality of the transmitted data or or even the, the hackers can send unauthorized commands to these imds sometimes the commands uh, causes the device to deliver an electrical shock and many more things can uh, be achieved uh, be implemented by hackers because of the vulnerability that comes because of the wireless communication how will the security risk be managed what are the key challenges that you see in addressing such uh, security risk to the implantable medical devices it's definitely an interesting question. I think a lot of it comes down to a risk assessment too of where the risks are better or worse because from a clinical standpoint, a lot of the wireless communications are very good from a patient safety perspective because basically by having the wireless communication where you, it would in the past require an invasive procedure to adjust the settings on that device, the wireless communication lets you basically you know, adjust the pacemaker settings or whatever device happens to be remotely without having to do an invasive surgical procedure to make changes to the system. So from a patient safety, patient recovery perspective, those are all great things because surgery itself proposes um, a risk and eliminating that basically reduces risk greatly in one area. But as you do mention, it does increase the cybersecurity risk as well. So the, the real question comes in is which risk is worse right now? is the risk of surgery worse for the patient or the risk of someone attacking the device? And that really remains to be seen. And it's quite an interesting question because some of the recent studies just show that among surveys of pacemakers, there's actually thousands of devices, um, thousands of vulnerabilities in some of these devices that could potentially be exploited. Um, so which direction that goes is going to be very interesting to see over the next year or two. Um, I know recently um, St. Jude had some recalls for some of their pacemakers for similar issues and whether that affects other vendors as well, it'll be quite interesting. But there are definitely some measures that could be taken to um, improve access control and improve um, encryption of data transmission. Yes, very true. I mean, uh, these are very complex challenges because, and some people are suggesting that maybe we should have cryptographic methods to provide the confidentiality and prevent unauthorized access. Now, if we use the encryption cryptographic methods uh, it also brings complex challenges because adding cryptography directly to imds also adds to the complex challenges to the devices itself and to the human safety and security isn't it it can um one area i can think of too is actually related to battery life um pacemakers and other stuff they have a finite lifetime and they basically run off a battery um, encryption does take more power to encrypt and decrypt messages. You could potentially shorten the lifetime of the battery, require more frequent surgeries. So, so there are a lot of issues to deal with. Um, so a lot of thought does have to be put into how you can secure these systems without making the system harm the patient at the same time or induce further harm on the clinical side. Yes, true, true. That is very true. Now, each of these IMDs, they have software and hardware. They both, you know, contain that. Now, if we need to update the software, is there any way to update that while it is already implanted into humans? It really depends on the design of the device. In my opinion, if the, device, if the device is designed properly, there should be some secure update mechanism to ensure that some type of signed firmware can be uploaded to the device to um, basically correct for errors and other stuff. Yes, that's very true. And I mean, uh, there are some that have already, maybe the new ones, the emerging ones will come with proper because now there is more awareness that we will be able to create proper procedures so that we can uh, 
update the software or if there is a need we can recall those devices and those uh, things maybe will be possible in the coming years but for the already implanted uh, probably millions of devices so far that may be difficult so those will create you know and carry different kind of risks than the ones that we will be uh, Emer the emerging devices would bring. So there are two different ways we'll have to approach these uh, medical devices uh, security, the ones that are already implanted and where we didn't have any way of updating the software or the any way of easily recalling those devices because they're already implanted. Uh, like you said, you know, other than the path of doing surgery, we won't be able to uh, access those devices again. And uh, those are very complex risks we'll have to uh, balance. So we will have to see how we address those risks. Now, implanted medical devices hacks, we all, know that it could be very personal because if somebody's insulin levels are you know changed uh, by the hackers and uh, something happens or if you know they go in cardiac arrest because of the pacemakers you know being hacked so there are many complex risks now are are there any procedures that the patients are made aware about the security risk to their life before they are you know agreeing to getting that um, those medical devices embedded in their body do we have pro effective procedures established that would really um depend on each individual surgeon and each individual um you know person talking to their their patient i don't think there really are any industry standard procedures for making the patient aware of potential cybersecurity risks it's really an issue that's just starting to gain attention and hasn't really gained enough attention yet um, it's only the last year or so you start to see some FDA recalls, things like that. So it, it's an issue that the media started to cover more and more. You're seeing increasing awareness about the issue, but um, it's only really a recent phenomenon that this has come to the forefront. Yes, very true. Now, social media always plays a very critical role in as far as you know security vulnerability goes, irrespective of industries. What role social media plays here for medical devices and its security vulnerability? I think social media can be used to raise awareness on pretty much any issue. Um, and I, like I said, I do think in recent years, you have seen more and more attention go to the, the medical device um, area and the vulnerability areas found in them. But it, it's very much a recent phenomenon. A lot of the um, older research was probably known within the security community, but hasn't really escaped to people outside the security community. The only real earlier example I can think of of anybody raising issues um, in the, the mass media about security issues was um, Dick Cheney's pacemaker, where I know they turned wireless off to um, prevent hacking attempts against it. Yes, true. Now, I mean, no one is thinking, uh, though social media has its own uh, risk and rewards, but no one is thinking about a CD scanner or an MRI machine and seeing a launch pad for a broader, broader you know, cybersecurity attack. Now, when people realize that while getting a simple test like an MRI, their life could be in danger, it is it creates sort of like panic you fear you know people would not want to go for you know this kind of test so how are hospitals and medical organizations preparing for uh, this kind of broader fear to be controlled because as there is more education as there is more awareness of the security risks that these kind of you know medical devices bring to human patients the people who are not only informed, people who are informed and understand the seriousness of having these medical devices, that why they are getting this uh, test done, because of their uh, life is in uh, danger, and they need to understand diag the diagnostic tests are necessary. But that also creates a lot of fear that some people might not want to go for those kind of tests. They would, you know, rather, you know, stay away and uh, back away from this kind of testing. So is there any approach effective approach taken by hospitals to calm the fears and uh, let the patients, uh, humans know that uh, things, you know, are in control. To be honest, I don't think it's a question most patients are asking. They're uh, not. I'm not actually aware of any patient, at least to my knowledge, um, that I've encountered that's ever really asked about the security of a particular device. That may change as more and more media awareness actually um, comes about about the vulnerabilities of these devices. but at least in my personal experience, I, I have not encountered a patient that's ever asked the question about um, that yet. I mean, in some sense, from a security perspective, hopefully they do, because that might provide an incentive for manufacturers to start making devices that are more and more secure. 
But on the manufacturer side, how I think that should be addressed is any medical device should be made so that if it fails, it fails in a manner that's safe to the patient. Mm -hmm. A failure on the cybersecurity side should not result in the ability for the device to stop performing its life critical function. Yes. Yes, that's uh, so. It seems it seems right now. It seems that uh, by 2006, concept of medical device hacking had become a mainstream concern. It is 2017 now. What progress has been made towards ensuring the trust in medical devices? The big initiatives that I'm aware of is you do have the um, recently um, released um, FDA guidance in 2014. They did their pre-market guidance, which focused heavily on, um, once again, it's non-binding guidance, but it did focus heavily on establishing access controls, establishing a method for um, ensuring the integrity of firmware and devices, establishing um, methods for encrypted communication. Um, and then at, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year, you had their um, post-market guidance released by the FDA. And that basically focused more on vulnerability disclosure, having update mechanisms in the devices and things like that. And unfortunately, those regulations are still non-binding. They're just suggestions at this point. They're not actual regulations. But um, hopefully that'll start to drive the industry towards thinking about security yeah. with the um, intent that at some point those regulations may become binding in some form. Um, some other initiatives are you have the Hippocratic Oath for Secure Medical Devices. That was an initiative launched by an organization called I Am The Calvary. Uh, basically, it was similar to get medical device manufacturers to think about making devices that are secure. And um, on the hospital side, you have the um, the OWASP document, basically, their secure medical device deployment standard, which basically is a list of things hospitals can do to take the devices once purchased from the manufacturer and securely deploy them within their own environments. Yes, no, that is very true. Those guidelines are uh, certainly, you are, like you said, they are not legally binding, but they are very, very useful, just like NIST cybersecurity risk management framework. Now, mm -hmm. while the first decade of the 21st century brought about significant changes in the medical device landscape, it said that by 2001, the number of implantable medical devices in, in just the U.S. was greater than 25 million. It's 2017 today, so it is... Probably we have millions more of uh, implantable medical devices. What are some high-profile security breaches that you have observed in the implantable devices over the years? Uh, implantable, the, the recent one is probably the um, St. Jude pacemakers um, with their mother at home transmitter. There were some issues with the, the transmitter that potentially could allow attacker to compromise the pacemaker. That's probably the, the most recent issue with implantable devices. On the non-implantable side, you've had things like the Hospirate infusion pumps that were recalled. Um, you've had some noted um, other the issues with the Bayer radiological devices with WannaCry. Um, and with some insulin pumps had issues too by another vendor. So, so there's been various um, medical device recalls in recent years, last couple of years for the most part, um, in which some attention has been paid to cybersecurity issues as the reason for the recall. Yes, yes, so it seems. Now, risk are not just because of uh, the hacked devices, but they also can come from stolen medical devices or lost medical devices. So how are hospitals monitoring these medical devices? Is there an effective process by which they know exactly how many uh, medical devices they have or what if there is anything lost or if there is anything stolen? Uh, stolen devices are actually a pretty big risk in healthcare. Um, if we include like not just medical devices, but like things like flash drives, portable media, laptop computers, things like that, according to the Verizon, the 2015 Verizon data breach report, that's actually the number one breach vector in healthcare is actually um, stolen equipment. So that is a huge, huge concern um, with healthcare. You're starting to see more and more of a push for encryption at rest um, across devices where possible. So basically, even if the device is stolen, um, the encryption theoretically should keep someone from accessing whatever data is on the device. So there's a big push for that. For things like laptops and mobile phones, you're seeing more and more mobile device management type software. Um, long term, there may even be a need to create mobile device management per se for medical devices, but I'm not aware of any type of initiative that currently does that. But that would definitely be um, something interesting to consider going forward. Yes, 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 very true. Now, with respect to medical devices, it seems that the security challenges are already getting very complex. And in the coming years, as we go more towards digitization and, you know, digital processes come, comes for the managing a lot of, you know, these uh, healthcare processes, it will get even more complex. So from your assessment, do you see 
the possibility that we the humans with our human intelligence limited human intelligence that we have that we will be able to manage the security risk of medical devices just by our efforts or do you see a need for artificial intelligence getting that we need to get artificial intelligence involved in managing this complex security risk i, I think security long term will probably be a combination of both because at some point your humans your employees they're going to have access to your data. They're going to process your data. They're going to have needs to look at your data. And that's always going to be a weak point in any organization. Um, if we look at most attacks, healthcare or other industries included, phishing remains one of the number one um, entry points for um, you know, breaches, for malware, for things like that, where basically a spear phishing email or something else comes through to an employee. An employee clicks a link. That link leads to the compromise of a PC, which is then used as a staging ground to start to compromise other um servers or PCs within the organization. Um, that's a very, very common, you know, malware outbreak or data breach type scenario. And, you know, the humans is one of the, the weakest links in that system. So yes, you can have your AI algorithms and other stuff do the threat analysis, um, basically prevent stuff from getting to the person. But at some point, there's always going to be something that's going to sneak through and a person's going to be the one to see the message and determine whether it's real or not. So I, I think you need a combination of things. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of your AI technologies can help reduce the risks that get to the person, but at some point there's always going to be a person involved and um, there are always going to be risk associated with the people as well. Yes, very true. It has to be an integrated approach. Now, many security problems we face are because we don't have a properly defined and planned digital infrastructure. Now, there is a hope that with the rise of blockchain, we have an ability to provide nations and industries, especially the healthcare sector, a secured approach to digital infrastructure. Because, you know, if all these medical devices are on blockchain, then if there is anything lost, if there is anything stolen, and, you know, those kind of security risks will be easily mitigated, managed. So do you see a blockchain playing a role in medical device security? Uh, it's hard to say at this point because I'm not aware of any um, vendors who actually tried any implementations involving blockchain. So it, it may have the potential to become something that could be done, but at the current time, I'm not aware of anyone who's actually trying that with medical devices. Um, so I, like I said, at this point, too, even if um, devices make a tendency to go more secure starting tomorrow when you start to see all these security features pop up, it's going to be a good 10 to 15 years before those new devices replace a lot of the current devices within healthcare. So I think that the bigger challenge right now is for healthcare organizations to start to take steps to secure their devices they're going to acquire in the near future and secure the devices they already have, um, because it's going to take time for other security features to start to become available to them through um, purchasing pipelines and other stuff. Yes, yes, very true. Now, if there, if there is a health, healthcare organization who wants to understand there's medical device security vulnerabilities and risk, where should they start? I've always been a big fan of actually testing security. Um, I, I'm very big on running mock incidents and other stuff like that. Like uh, one of the things that I've done before is we've actually done mock malware outbreaks at the organization um, where we've actually taken um, what's known as the ICAR test string. It's basically a harmless string. Um, and if you execute it, though, it's recognized by all antivirus software as a virus, even though it's harmless. It's designed to test um, antivirus systems. So one of the incidents that I've done, for instance, is wrote a script to actually start deploying that to PCs in the hospital. And we actually waited to um, basically see the results. So it, the script started to infect PCs. We could actually see how the virus traversed through the network, where it did, where it didn't, how the people reacted to the system. And I think it's, testing stuff like that is a great way to evaluate actual security. Because um, like you might have bought that expensive firewall or whatever else, but how do you actually know if it's configured properly, if the rules that you think are in place right actually are, and so you actually go ahead and test them. And I think doing actual real-world tests like that actually are a great way to prove that the security you're putting in place actually does work. Um, so it's great for actually testing the controls you have in place. It's also great for testing the responses of people and for using it for awareness training and other stuff. Um, for example, because if an incident does happen, a lot of the damage um, the potential is going to depend on how fast your people react to the, the incident how fast they can contain it, how fast they can identify it, various things like that. So constantly drilling your staff like that also improves staff response times. Or if it's a, like a ransomware outbreak and um, you have to recover systems from backup, 
it's very good to have tested your backups in advance to make sure you actually can restore the data, not to find out that you um, suddenly, you know, when your tapes is bad and your data is unrecoverable because you never tested it to actually see. So drilling stuff like that all the time is a very good way to do that. I think that should apply to medical devices as well. Once you configure and set up your medical devices in your network, basically test it to see how well you can keep it secure. Um, you know, see if a penetration test can get into the device. Um, simulate a compromised device to see if it can escape your network isolation and affect other areas of the hospital. I'm a very big proponent of actually testing to see if you can keep the device secure. Yes, yes. No, that's that's a very good point. And with the automated pan testing emerging, it could be very useful, you know, on a daily basis to te test all those medical devices so that uh, we can easily identify where we stand as far as the security goes. Now, many of these medical devices, many of the hospitals or even, you know, most of the institutions, irrespective of industry, they like to transfer their risk when they know that uh, there are difficult risks emerging, that they it will be difficult to manage them. So they, if there are ways to ensure those risks, uh, each and every institution, they like to, you know, uh, or even human beings, they like to transfer those risks and uh, um, purchase the insur uh, insurance policies on that. How widely the risk transfer or insurance approach is taken by the hospitals as far as the medical device security goes? Uh, it's becoming more common, maybe not for medical devices in particular, but um, data breach policies for healthcare organizations are becoming more and more common. You're seeing more and more adoption of them. But realistically, too, that might help cover a lot of your direct financial costs, but there's also all the indirect costs associated with risk that are harder to quantify and harder for insurance to cover, things like loss of reputation, things like that. So yes, you can transfer some of the risk, but I don't think it's feasible to transfer all of the risk because if you do suffer a big breach, maybe that makes a patient think twice about coming to your hospital. Um, so yeah, the insurance might have paid for the recovery from the breach. It might have you know paid for all the um, you know identity theft um, protection things like that for the people who were involved in the breach. But um, insurance really can't stop things like your loss of reputation, things like that, um, from impacting your business. Yes, yes. So now, um, you uh, in the beginning, you talked about the FDA recommendations that, you know, these are the guidelines and they are not mandatory. But what are these recommendations for hospitals by the FDA that will, that are used for mitigating and managing cybersecurity threats? They have, like you were saying before, that they have given several recommendations and well, while they are not legally binding, these guidelines are expected to be implemented by these hospitals or uh, individual healthcare practices or any of the doctors in any other form nursing homes or any other uh, nature of the uh, healthcare facility so are they effectively using those guidelines to manage their cyber security threats the guidelines are very very recent so it's um basically it's wait and see at this point to see how well they're going to be adopted by manufacturers um hopefully with the combination of the guidelines and all the recent media attention that you do start to see more and more secure medical devices coming down but i think at this point i guess the best thing hospitals can do is to really vote with their wallet and when they start to do new acquisitions for software really take the time to do the security assessments ahead of time to request the bill of materials that lists all of the components um software wise that are involved in the device um, things like that, because it may not be the vendor software directly that's easily exploitable, but it may be the old version of Windows the device is built on, or an older version of Apache or whatever um, software libraries they're dependent on. So having a list of all the components that make up the software to um, see if they're up to date, to see um, how vulnerable they are, things like that, to do those assessments before you actually go ahead and purchase the device. And I think that's one of the most effective things hospitals can do at this time to start to push for manufacturers to actually change. Yes, so, I mean, uh, there are separate guidelines for both the medical device manufacturers as well as the hospital operators and owners. Now, as, when it comes to medical device manufacturers, what are the specific uh, recommendations that the FDA has uh, issued for managing the cybersecurity threats? You mentioned some of that uh, uh, just now, but what are the specific recommendations that are really critical as far as the security goes? A lot of their pre-market guidance is heavily geared towards access control having different mechanisms to authenticate people, to restrict access to only people who need access to the device, 
Um, they also have recommendations in their pre-market guidance regarding secure firmware and for the secure transmission of um, data. Um, that's largely what their pre-market guidance, and that goes back to 2014, is centered upon. Uh, towards the end of last year, they did release what they call their post-market guidance, and that is more heavily centered around the patching of devices once the device is um, basically in the wild and sold to, to hospitals, as well as um, vulnerability disclosure to basically make hospitals aware when a vulnerability pops up within the device. It basically encourages manufacturers to have mechanisms for updating the devices once they're sold. Sure. You now, talking about that, it seems that the new FDA guidance makes it clear that routine patches and updates, they don't need to be reported or reviewed by the FDA each and every time there, something happens. Vulnerabilities don't need to be reported unless they cause deaths or some you know, other adverse events. Or if that cannot be patched within 60 days, are manufacturers required to notify users of any security vulnerability update? Because if, if they are not required, then we are not going to see any information coming from the manufacturers about any vulnerability that they have identified after these, uh, those devices have been um, purchased or you know, sold already and implanted or uh, start getting used. Because unless there is... A, some sort of uh, consequences or some sort of accountability, then they are not going to talk about it. Why should they, you know, notify if uh, they are going to get into some legal trouble or some, you know, other kind of troubles? And if, and if FDA guidelines, you know, are not recommending them that they need to uh, notify that. So uh, this seems to be very, you know, not very clear as far as the FDA guidance goes from my perspective. Yeah, right now the FDA guidance is non-binding, but it is a step in the right direction. And you also have a lot of um, third-party companies who are very actively looking at medical device security um, for all kinds of reasons. Like you had recent studies done on pacemakers that showed across a wide range of pacemakers that they discovered thousands of vulnerabilities. Um, you've had that for lots of other types of medical devices. Third-party researchers have found flaws in insulin pumps, um, infusion pumps, all kinds of medical devices. And I think you're getting more and more media attention on that. Um, and the FDA has released some recalls recently. So the maybe disclosure by the manufacturer is not yet mandated. But when the FDA was made aware of certain vulnerabilities in certain devices, they did force the manufacturers to issue recalls for some of the devices. So um, there is, I guess, some um, mechanisms in place to have ma encourage manufacturers to do the right thing and keep their devices secure. Yes. Now, I mean, we all acknowledge that all medical devices carry a certain amount of risk. We cannot uh, ever expect that ever, anything is completely risk-free. Now, while the FDA allows devices to be marketed, when there is reasonable assurance that the benefits to patients outweigh the risk, what risk variables FDA evaluates? What are the criteria they are considering we, when they go out and say that, uh, okay, you can start uh, marketing and selling your devices? It's typically um, safety to the patient is basically what they primarily look at. And um, as we're starting to see is the potential for cybersecurity issues to affect patient safety is becoming a real issue. Um, you know, if that ransomware brings down a you know, surgical robot or a telemetry monitor using to monitor somebody for potential cardiac arrest or something like that, um, there are real life-threatening potential conditions that can exist if that device fails. So I think you're starting to get more and more notice that um, – patient safety issues and cybersecurity issues do have an area where they intersect and that in order for patient safety to be guaranteed, there needs to be some minimum requirements for cybersecurity. I mean, realistically, somebody compromising a pacemaker or something else really could lead to a whole new and wholly unacceptable meaning for a denial of service. And um, that type of risk has to be considered as well in those decisions. Yes, yes, very true. Now. We all are moving towards the electronic health record. I mean, uh, all the developed nations and also developing nations are more uh, going to move towards that. That looks like the trend. Now, while increasing opportunities for health information exchange, standardized data collections for use in medical research, and also many, many different treatment options for patients are, as we see that these are the potential benefits of the uh, EHR systems, that means the electronic health record systems, centralized EHR systems creates very complex risk and it opens the door for these malicious actors trying to 
get access to the greater lot of you know records at the same time in just you know at a very low cost and very little effort on their side because they don't have to hack multiple different systems you know everywhere that uh, different hospitals if all these records are centralized with just very little effort from their side they are able to they will be able to get access to large numbers of uh, these medical records so from your perspective how secure are these electronic health records in all its storage formats irrespective of whether it's hard drive servers or cloud it really is going to vary somewhere from organization to organization and system to system. But one of the big issues um, healthcare organizations face is medical data can be extremely valuable. Um, most estimates show that medical data can sell for up to 10 times what a credit card number can sell for. Um, reason being is most medical records basically contain enough information to do identity theft very completely. Um, it's going to have the person's name, it's going to have their address, it's probably going to have a social security number if it's in the U.S., it might have financial data like credit cards attached to it. You have insurance numbers, things like that for potential insurance fraud. Um, you have a lot of various mechanisms in that data that can be used for identity theft. Um, so healthcare data is very, very valuable. And on top of that, healthcare data is often used in ways that you wouldn't traditionally expect. Like, for example, there's a big black market for clean lung x-rays right now. You have a lot of people in foreign countries who want to come to places like the U.S. They won't let you get a visa if you have TB. So... If you want to um, get the visa, you basically need to supply a clean lung x-ray, and there's actually a black market for things like lung x-rays right now. So data is actually valuable in a lot of ways that people wouldn't even normally think about. And it makes um, healthcare, I guess, a very ripe target because of that, because there's a gold mine worth of data sitting in every hospital or physician's electronic um, system there. So um, there's, there's definitely a lot of risks associated with that. But um, in, in terms of the security, it really depends on each individual hospital and the job they do at deploying it in addition to um, the maker of the software that the hospital deploys. So there's two parts to that equation. Yes, very true, very true. Now, from your assessment, what role information sharing analysis organization plays in medical device security? Do they play a central role? Are you talking things like US CERT, things like that for yeah. issuing warnings? Uh, there have been some recent warnings concerning medical devices. So. There has been some vulnerability disclosure that was made public through organizations like that. Um, and I, I think you're going to start to see more of that going forward because medical devices are becoming increasingly targeted by both attackers as well as um, you know, white hat pen testers um, looking to test the security devices. So I do think you will see more and more vulnerabilities becoming public through mechanisms like that. Yes, very true. Now, the, uh, we have seen the NIC, I mean, everyone has... Uh, probably you know come across the nist cybersecurity framework and they are acknowledging the need for that kind of security framework what hurdles do you see for medical device security based on the current status of nist implementation and acknowledgement on the hospital side i think the, the biggest challenge is lack of um, resources to implement security controls at that Unfortunately, a lot of hospitals still don't have robust security teams, things like that. They're, they're lacking the, the personnel and the skill set to actually do security well. I think that's something that needs to, to change. There needs to be more security um, training and ability within most health care organizations, um, in addition to the manufacturers improving the security of their systems. Yes, yes, very true. Now, healthcare is on its way to becoming the largest attack surface for cybersecurity warfare. So the big question for everyone involved in the healthcare security is where would this end and what can be done? What do you think? Uh, it's definitely one of the biggest uh, attack surfaces. I mean, you do have problems with like the electric grid and other stuff. So there are other potential um, big attack surfaces for cyber attacks as well. But healthcare is definitely up there. And uh, I think in general, hospitals need to approach security much more holistically. They need to not just focus on the security of IT systems, but also consider that um, you know that average person checking their email could be just as critical to security, and often that employee is one of the first lines of defense. Um, realistically, um, security has to be done holistically. Security basically is everyone in the organization's responsibility, not just the people in IT or the people in security. And um, that kind of mindset needs to be approached within healthcare, that everyone has to play a role in keeping the organization secure. And that's one of the best things I think that organizations can do. Because once you have that kind of mindset in place, the rest kind of follows too. 
people will then think about if we're going to deploy that new medical device, we have to do it in this way because it helps the organization as a whole. You need to get that mindset through the healthcare organizations that security really is important, that everyone needs to have a role in keeping the organization secure. Absolutely, absolutely. You you are so right on that. And it, the approach has to be holistic, integrated. If you look at secre- security, we cannot think of it as cybersecurity risk are different, geosecurity risk are different, and you know address space security risk differently. They all are integrated and interconnected, and we have to have an integrated CGS approach. And more more than that. Each and every individual and each and every entity across nations, is government, industries, organizations, and academia, they all have to play a role in managing the security risk. So if you're talking about healthcare, it's not just the patients or the hospital administrator or the IT department, but the, also the manufacturers and also the all the other stakeholders that are involved. So it is an integrated approach. And unless we have a holistic view of that, and unless we have an approach by which we can integrate all those risks, it's going to be very difficult uh, to manage the medical device security risk. Now, and security is a game of trade-offs and the stakes are never higher than in healthcare. So the steps we take today will largely define the future of medical device security and where we go. So what future do you see of not only medical device security, but hospitals and healthcare organizations as we take a step forward in the digital global age? I think things are going in the right direction, but I think there's still a long way to go. I think um, things like WannaCry and stuff were a big wake-up call to a lot of um, healthcare organizations. Um, it brought m- many, many companies down, some whole health systems down. Um, various things like that ha- have been a real wake-up call to a lot of healthcare organizations. And um, hopefully it serves as enough of a wake-up call that um, health- healthcare in general tries to start to take security seriously and start to lock things down better, start to increase security awareness amongst employees um, because there are very real vulnerabilities there. And, um, you know, hopefully there's not a second attack like that that brings a lot of systems down because there is the potential for loss of human life and stuff like that. So um, going forward, I really do hope that organizations are more proactive about security uh, rather than reactive. Yes, very true. That's uh, that's what we all ho- are hoping that you know there is a proactive approach over reactive approach. Now you are the author of the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP Secure Medical Device Deployment Standard, and one of the authors of the OWASP Anti Ransomware Guide. Would you like to share some information about your publications and wherever global viewers and listeners can find information if they are interested? Sure. Uh, both um, documents are available from uh, OWASP.org. Um, they also basically come up in Google pretty easily if you search for the title of each one. And the OWASP Secure Medical Device Deployment Standard, that's mostly focused for healthcare organizations, and it goes through a list of controls that organizations can put in place to securely deploy their medical devices. Unlike the FDA guidance, which focus on the manufacturer side, that targets more the healthcare organizations themselves and how they can go about securely putting those devices within their environment. Um, Basically, for organizations that have a lot of legacy devices, I would recommend they start with a risk assessment and basically adopt the controls that they feel would mitigate their biggest risks, as implementing every control may not be possible in all cases. Um, Likewise, the OWASP Anti-Ransomware Guide, its um, current version has a set of 45 different controls that organizations can put in place to help them both um, protect against ransomware attacks, mitigate attacks in progress, as well as recover from attacks um, that have already occurred. Thank you for sharing that information, uh, Christopher, and thank you for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on medical device security, and our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the understanding you provided on the need for application of security fundamentals across medical devices, and especially the holistic approach that uh, we all are promoting. Even if a single individual or entity is able to come up with ideas to secure medical devices, innovate to develop intelligent systems for the medicine and the healthcare and manage these associated security risk based on the understanding they received from this discussion we had today. This risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, Christopher. So as we evaluate the medical device security risk, the concerns that in the coming years, we the humans with our limited human intelligence will not be able to secure medical devices surrounding us just by our human efforts is getting very real. 
Risk Group Cyber Security Risk Research Center and Strategic Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS, that means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. It is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security, so if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos, or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree Pandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.